Hello, my name is Zoe James and I'm an Associate Professor in Criminology at the University of Plymouth. I'm really pleased today to be able to come and talk to you via the internet about the harms of hate against gypsies and travellers. As well as being an academic at the University of Plymouth, I'm also a member of a number of um, international and national networks. And for me, the most important of those is the International Network for Hate Studies, of which I'm a co-director. And I'm really proud to work with the International Network for Hate Studies because it's an organisation that's not profit making. It's purely a networking space for people to come together to talk about hate and hate studies. And we bring together academics, practitioners and policy makers, but also we try to engage with the general public to hold events um, and to share information about hate and hate studies. And so I would encourage anyone who's interested in exploring this issue any further to have a look at our website. And I've put the address on the, um, on the screen there. So it's internationalhatestudies.com. Please do visit, there's a huge library um, and it's very accessible. So um, I just thought I'd flag that up at the start. So <clears throat> today, how, how did I get here? How did I get to study this topic? Well, I've been working with gypsies and travellers for a long time. I've been an academic for over 25 years and I've been very committed to exploring discrimination um, that gypsies and travellers have experienced. I started off as a research officer at the Home Office doing a research study on a piece of legislation that came in to address trespass and that really impacted on gypsies and travellers lives and I ended up writing my PhD about it and over time I've spent a lot of, uh, a lot of academic time working with gypsies and travellers to explore how they've experienced policing um, how accommodation issues impact um, their everyday lives, talking to them about their mobility, but increasingly in the contemporary era I've been talking to them about their experiences of victimisation and specifically their experiences of hate. As an academic, <coughs> excuse me, you go through um, quite a long journey over time and you're constantly learning and challenging yourself about how you understand what's going on around you. And criminology is a meeting point discipline where we talk about lots of different issues. We talk about how the law's used, how the criminal justice system works, but also increasingly we've started to look in other directions. We've tried to understand, rather than just looking at crime, we've tried to understand the harm that occurs in society, what's harmful as well as what's criminal because those two things don't necessarily cohere. And part of that, for me, has been about taking on new theoretical tools, new ways of looking at the world. And I have found it really useful to try and understand how contemporary neoliberal capitalism works in order to address the harms of hate that gypsies and travellers experience. And I've done that through using a criminological theory called ultra realism. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that later on in the talk. But I'm going to um, go through, first of all, the different experiences of hate harms that gypsies and travellers have. <clears throat> um, so the, the piece of research that I'm citing in this presentation is research that I carried out a really small little project on um, in the southwest. So obviously I'm based in Plymouth and I did a piece of work um, on gypsy and traveller accommodation and the people that we were working with at the time were really kind and said that I could tag on some research questions um, to the accommodation survey we were doing and they said I could tag on some questions around hate and this was important because we don't know much about hate that is experienced by gypsies and travellers. There's some great work being done by some civil society organisations. So we have Traveller Movement have done some really interesting work around um, experiences of discrimination and crime for gypsies and travellers. And also there's been work done um, by another great civil society organisation called Gate Hearts, where they've actually set up a national reporting centre for gypsies and travellers 
to um, report hate against them. But we know very little empirically about hate against gypsies and travellers. So I see my job as exploring that a little bit and trying to understand why we don't know more about it, but also to really try and unpack how hate happens for gypsies and travellers um, throughout their lives. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm asthmatic, so I will cough a little bit through this. Um, <clears throat> so research on this in the Southwest on hate has um, that I did was with 79 respondents. So it's a not a huge sample. But shockingly, in that sample, we were found that there were 20, 225 reports of hate experienced by the gypsies and travellers that we spoke to. That's a huge amount considering you're only talking to uh, quite a disparate community across a rural region. You know, people are experiencing hate on an everyday basis. So we need to unpack that and see what's going on. And that's what I'm gonna do through this presentation. So let's think about it. Let's, who are the gypsies and travelers of the UK? Who are we talking about here? And there are lots of myths and stereotypes about gypsies and travelers. And we need to be clear that we're talking about a very diverse range of peoples. We're talking about people who come from Romani backgrounds. We're talking about people who come from Irish backgrounds. But we're also talking about people who um, run fairs and showgrounds, so show people. And we're also talking about new travellers, people who came to travelling lifestyles and were inspired by traditional gypsies and travellers over time and they came to it in the 70s and are now in their second third generation of um, traveling families. Romani gypsies have um, origins from um, arguably India over centuries but Romani gypsies have been in the UK for a very long time and uh, in Scotland there are Scottish gypsies and travelers, there are um, Welsh kale who live um, in particularly in northern Wales um, that have some sort of Romani connections. Irish travellers have been in this country um, for centuries likewise um, and particularly came to the country in the um, 19th century. Show people have had uh, um, have ancient charter to hold fairs from the 12th century so we've always celebrated fairs and carnival in, in our culture and show people are the people that offer that around the country and as I say new travellers came to the travelling lifestyle in the 1970s as a consequence of the, um, the festival circuit associated with music etc but they're actually really conforming to an, a way of living that they saw as a more sustainable way of living and also often research has shown that new travellers were pushed onto the road due to negative circumstances that they were experiencing in settled housing. So all of these people come under the moniker of gypsies and travellers. And I haven't included in this presentation, and I haven't in my book, I haven't included Roma. So Roma are European migrants largely from Central and Eastern Europe who share a common ancestry with Romani gypsies. And it's important that we acknowledge the Roma and we acknowledge Roma needs and experiences. And tragically, we are aware that Roma also suffer the harms of hate. But my research hasn't incorporated the Roma and, um, and therefore I'm not going to talk about them here. Um, I have done in other pieces of work when I've looked at um, the European wide experience. But the Roma have a very specific experience based on their um, experiences of migration. So, um, yeah, I'm going to focus on gypsies and travellers the, from the UK today um, when I talk about them. And some of the images that I've put on this screen may be familiar to you. Um, so I've got a picture of um, a show person with their fairground. I've got a very traditional image of um, Romani gypsies with their... Um, with their horses, and then a more contemporary picture of um, some Irish travellers with their caravan, and then another picture which is um, a new travelling um, vehicle. 
international. So we have lots of different people who live in the UK, um, who are gypsies and travellers. And there are estimates, estimates that gypsies and travellers make up something like 1% of the national population. But they're very variable statistics. So you get you get people um, saying that there's about 200,000 gypsies and travellers ranging up to one and a half percent of the population. And the reason we don't know is because gypsies and travellers experience such significant exclusion and discrimination that they often don't um, highlight their identity in multiple contexts. But also, importantly, their identities aren't recorded by anyone. So it's only in the last census that there was a category for Romany Gypsies and Irish travellers. OK, so I'm going to move on and um, and just try and kind of note some of the issues that are going to come up through the presentation. So we have a real issue with identity and identity politics in the UK and the Black Lives Matters protests recently have really highlighted some of the issues that we have in relation to identity and some of the embedded um, prejudice that we have in our society. And sadly, gypsies and travellers are subject to this um, to a, a significant degree. And we get some really problematic mediated portrayals of gypsies and travellers um, in the UK. Most recently, there was a, a television programme um, that was called, um, I can't remember what it was called, the, it was by Dispatches. Um, and oh, it was The Truth About Traveller Crime, I think it was called. And it was dreadful. It didn't tell any truths. It was extremely just distorted. The people engaged in it to speak um, were uh, either hoodwinked into doing it or were problematic. And it really presented gypsies and travellers as endemically criminal, which is just absolute tosh. There's no evidence to suggest that's the case. So we have these really strange portrayals presented to us of gypsies and travellers. One of the other ones was um, that's been really uh, powerful and important over the last few years has been my big fat gypsy wedding. That was the most watched uh, Channel 4 documentary um, in, in the time that it was presented. I think it was in 2010. And it portrayed actually Irish travellers often um, in a very extreme way through editing that didn't represent communities comprehensively or drew out specific aspects of community without any contextual explanation. And, you know, that's really problematic. We get these distorted tales about gypsies and travellers. Only yesterday I went on um, my local news and found um, a load of um, posts about a, a stopping place where gypsies and travellers had stopped in the local area and people talking about them being thieves and leaving rubbish, etc. And these are really distorted tales that are imbued with prejudice. And we really need to think about how we come up with those views, why we have such racist perceptions of gypsies and travellers. Um, and why we consider them so negatively in our society. And part of that, and this is a, an important part of that, is this sort of mythical notion that we have of the true gypsy, of the true Romany gypsy in a bow top wagon, you know, freely traveling, traveling around the countryside. That is, there are some Romany gypsies who live in bow top wagons still, but you know, like we don't live in um, historic places necessarily, um, neither did gypsies and travellers, they are from modern amenities. And it really presents this picture of the only authentic person, gypsy or traveller, is a gypsy or traveller who is of Romany descent and also lives according to those very old fashioned um, ways of living. In reality, actually, new travellers often are more likely to live in those sort of old style gypsy and traveller um, ways. So the photograph that I've put on this screen at the bottom um, on the, I don't know which side it'll be, yeah, on the right hand side um, is of some new travellers living in a boat or wagon. So we have these distorted perceptions and there are hierarchies of identity. 
that feed into these distorted tales. And we need to think about why that's happening. And I'm going to unpack some of that as I go through the presentation. And I'm going to do that by using three different mechanisms to understand how hate harms occur. And I use a theoretical framework. As I said, I'm informed by ultra realist criminology. But I've in my book, I've used um, Zizek, who's a political philosopher. I've used his um, breakdown of how violence manifests in contemporary society. And it's really useful because what it does is it takes um, our understanding of harm and what is harmful to us and what is ill treatment in society. And it breaks that down into um, different sort of perceptive um, ways. And so the first thing that I'm going to talk about is the violence in society that we experience very directly, that we can easily see and that we can kind of have empathy with because we can sub we subjectively experience it. So those are the things that we can easily package and draw around a line around. So I'm going to talk about some hate, hate crimes and the, my participants' research, participants' experiences of hate crime. I'm also going to talk about hate incidents and hate speech. So I'm going to talk about those things that we can measure, that we can see very clearly, that are largely distant from us. Um, and even for gypsies and travellers that experience those harms, they can clearly identify them as harmful and express that to agencies or people, others, that they need to um, tell, tell what's going on. The next type of hate that I'm going to talk about is systemic violence. And systemic violence is um, the harms of hate that are embedded in our systems of everyday life. And so that allows us the opportunity to really draw out gypsies and travellers' experiences of specifically, in this case, I'm going to talk about discrimination, I'm going to talk about criminalisation, and I'm going to talk about social exclusion. And in order to understand gypsies and travellers' experiences and to really truly engage with them, we need to really appreciate how much they are discriminated against and what that means for their everyday lives. And the third thing I'm going to pull out is I'm going to talk about symbolic violence. Now, symbolic violence is uh, how harm happens in society by the very nature of the organisation of that society. And within the contemporary period, our society is ordered around uh, neoliberal political um, a neoliberal capitalist political economy. So we have a system that is based around neoliberal capitalism. And so we need to understand how that impacts on everyday lived experience. And that, that is encapsulated in managerialism in public services and delivery of services. And I'm going to unpack this a little bit more later on. It is in um, the reform of welfare that we've particularly seen um, over recent years and communitarianism and communitarianism refers to the way in which we have been responsibilized as individuals in our society we have been um, since the particularly since the early 1990s um, and into the new labor government in the late 1990s we saw this emphasis around rights and human rights and engagement in society around a notion of rights and responsibilities. So rather than us um, having a cohesive welfare state that was perceived as a safety net for us all, it started to become a discussion around you've got a safety net but you have to take responsibility for yourself. And that responsabilization has, has really been embedded into our contemporary society. So if, if you're not seen as taking responsibility for yourself, then you, you know, do you really deserve to have things given to you by the state, for example? That's kind of the way the argument goes. 
So I want to talk about that and talk about how that impacts on gypsies and travellers. Okay, so as I said, this um, talk is based on a piece of research that I did in the southwest, a really small study, 79 people responded. Um, and so this is not a piece of work that is national, it doesn't give us a, a really robust picture of the national experience. But what it does do is it allows us a view, a little view into the um, Gypsy and Traveller experience. And that's really important because, as I said, we have very little information about this area. And what we found in the research was that there was a significant amount of hate crime experienced by Gypsies and Travellers. And what that means, a hate crime is any crime, so it could be um, a theft, it could be an assault, it could be um, criminal damage, any crime that is motivated by a bias towards the person um, that the crime's committed against. So harming someone, committing a crime against them on the basis of their identity. And what we found was that Gypsies and travellers had really, really significant experiences of this. So 30% of the respondents to the, the research had experienced minor damage to their property on the basis of their identity. There's a study by Traveller Movement that um, found that um, people were experiencing um, graffiti, for example, on the outside of their homes. As I say, 30% of our respondents had experienced that sort of minor damage, considered minor, but you know, any sort of damage to your property on the basis of your identity is hugely problematic. And I should say as well that this research incorporated Romani gypsies, um, new travellers and um, Irish travellers, I think a couple of show people as well. We found that 20% of respondents had experienced serious damage to their property. And not only were people experiencing damage to their property on the basis of their identity, they were actually being physically assaulted. So they'd experienced, 20% of the respondents had experienced a, a minor physical assault and 15% of them had experienced a serious physical assault. Now, could I say, you know, would it be true if I went around, were I in a room with you all, would I be able to say, that you know, 15% of you had experienced a serious physical assault on the basis of your identity. You know, it, that, that's a really sig significant statistic and really problematic. And what's really sad is that gypsies and travellers are very reticent about reporting hate crimes against them. So there were very low level of um, reports of physical assaults, for example, which you would expect people to report to formal agencies. So there were these, these very you know, serious offences committed on the basis of a bias motivation are a reality for gypsies and travellers. And, and what we have to remember is that we know from research that when a hate crime happens, it's not just the person who experiences that crime that is harmed. The community is harmed because it's an assault against an identity. And that is, is really problematic. There were a number of other crimes that gypsies and travellers reported to us. So they reported, 20% of them reported things like burglary, theft, stone throwing, brick throwing, being shot at arson these are these are this is horrendous you know so if we just look at the crimes that people are, have experienced that's really troubling it's, it's upsetting and worrying but we need to go beyond that because that's not the entirety of the lived experience for gypsies and travelers the entirety of that experience is um far broader and hate incidents are non-crime events, so they're not actually crimes, but they're, they're um, incidents that have occurred on the basis of a bias motivation. 
So in our research, 81% of the respondents had experienced name calling. But, you know, that's huge. 71% of respondents had been bullied. 29% of respondents spoke of a range of other incidents. So you're talking about people telling us about threats and intimidation. And not just threats and intimidation, but sexualized intimidation as well. Harassment, unwanted photography or filming. And people are not reporting this. Now, the police and um, government uh, policy has provide space for hate reporting, for hate reporting of incidents and crimes, because it's recognized that the more incidents that occur, the more likely crimes will also occur. Now, all of these things are shocking, but when you start looking at, you know, how people talk about gypsies and travelers, it becomes less surprising, sadly. So as I said, I was looking at my local news and there were lots of comments about the um, gypsies and travellers that had settled briefly in my local area. And those comments were people who were saying they were scared, that they thought they were going to have their homes broken into, that they thought there was going to be loads of rubbish. All of these stereotypes that people have embedded in their psyche and they're, you know, taking this out, obviously, evidently, on gypsies and travellers themselves in these multiple ways. And I reiterate, there were only 79 respondents to this piece of work, and yet 225 incidents and crimes were, were committed against them. This is, you know, this is a lot. In terms of hate speech, um, there is the name calling, etc. But the way that I've kind of pulled this out a little bit is using other people's research that's really important. As, a, as an academic, my job is to kind of pull together what we know about things and try and express them and explain them to people. And um, the report racism website, um, Gate Hearts, which provides space for, so Gate stands for Gypsy and Traveller Exchange. Um, that, that website had, um, has really noticed a significant increase in online hate speech and they they found that 67 sorry 67 percent of people who reported to them reported um, that hate speech was occurring online and a really interesting piece of work um, done by an organization called hate base that uh, measures hate speech on twitter um, found that the most common hate speech in the UK derives from insults used against the gypsy or traveller community. Now they're not saying that it's targeting gypsies or travellers, but what they're saying is that gypsies and travellers are experiencing that hatred. Honestly, I've silenced everything and my phone's just rung. I do apologise. How often does the landline ring? Okay, so um, so it, yeah, the point of this is that it's really interesting because people are using uh, negative speech about gypsies and travellers as general slurs. Now that's really, you know, that's really interesting because that tells us that the, the public lexicon, the way we talk about people negatively, incorporates a negative attitude and approach towards gypsies and travellers. And, and research, you know, shows that people in the UK have very negative views of gypsies and travellers. Um, the 2014 Global Attitude Survey carried out by Pew, Center, Pew Research Centre found that 50% of UK respondents held negative views of gypsies and travellers. And that's far higher than any other group. So it's higher than attitudes towards Muslim communities um, or any other community. And we can think about this in terms of some of the hate that is um, put out there by the media. We can think about this in terms of the hate speech that's embedded in the media, but also embedded in political statements and political attitudes. Um, there are quite a significant number of studies that have shown that um, politicians in, um, when they're talking in parliament speak very negatively about gypsies and travellers. They particularly talk negatively about Irish travellers and about um, other travellers. And they tend to embrace the myth of the Romany Gypsy. 
Now, the Roman Egypti has a wonderful, interesting, fascinating, fascinating tradition and culture. And I know Damien Labar is doing a, a, a talk for this event, which is fantastic. Damien's work is great. His book is, is a wonderful depiction of his um, time growing up. But there's sort of this idea that some people are legitimate and some people are not, it's, it's really problematic. And it's similar to the treatment of um, other, other peoples. So those people who are considered authentic and those people who are not. So what I want to move on to now is talking about um, systemic hate harms. <clears throat> so where in our systems, do we have, uh, I'm just looking at the time, sorry. Uh, where in our systems do we see problems arising? So we can see that people are expressing an anger, a hatred towards gypsies and travellers. But when I interviewed, um, over time actually, in a number of different research projects, and including in this particular research project where I cited some data, what we found is that when we ask gypsies and travellers about their experiences of hate, they don't just talk about hate crimes and incidents and hate speech. They also talk about discrimination and they conflate their experiences of discrimination with crime and crime problems. And that's because it's all very much on a continuum for them of ill treatment, being treated badly. Now, there's lots of, of aspects to this, but one of the key things for gypsies and travellers has been that there is um, a lack of accommodation provided to gypsies and travellers throughout the um, country. And there's a significant history to this. So what happened was historically, back in the day, gypsies and travellers had places that they traditionally stopped and stayed on as they moved around the country to go and pursue work opportunities, to go and visit family, to attend weddings or funerals. And um, those spaces were regularly common land. But in the 1960s, the common land was closed to gypsies and travellers through a specific piece of legislation in 1960. And with that closure of the commons, came an expectation to, to ameliorate the idea that gypsies and travellers stopping places were being lost. Local authorities were required under law to provide sufficient spaces for gypsies and travellers to stop and stay on and for them to stay for permanently <coughs> or for them to stop on in transit from one place to the other. Now it's important here, I think, for me to note that gypsies and travellers um, are nomads in their culture, but that doesn't necessarily mean mobility. It doesn't necessarily mean they're moving all the time. So you often hear these, these uh, slurs against gypsies and travellers, oh, well, they're travellers, why aren't they travelling? Well, there's lots of really good work um, done by particularly by human geographers around the fact that actually when we move, we need somewhere to stop. And being nomadic is not simply about being mobile. It's about how you think and see the world, how you view the world generally. Um, and it's part of your cultural way of thinking. And gypsies and travellers have a very flexible notion of space and place. So when the commons were closed in the 1960s and local authorities were expected to provide spaces for gypsies and travellers, very little happened. Gypsies and travellers were not provided sufficient space and they never have been. And despite numerous attempts to provide space for gypsies and travellers, there has been a public kickback against that local areas, people complaining, saying they don't want gypsies and travellers in their area. And that is based on essentially a racist attitude towards gypsies and travellers, that they are not welcome in our spaces. And that's been massively problematic because local authorities haven't provided and that has meant that gypsies and travellers have had insufficient places to stop and stay. 
and local authorities have shirked their general responsibilities over a really significant period of time. I've been involved in more recent years in accommodation assessments for gypsies and travellers in the southwest and while there has been some provision of spaces um, it certainly hasn't been comprehensive and there's a real reticence amongst local authorities it's not necessarily amongst the local authority working people it's often the politicians within local authorities who are fearful of gaining losing votes on the basis of um, supporting gypsy and tra traveler site provision over time many gypsies and travelers have moved into housing but they have it evidence has been presented to the courts and the courts have accepted that gypsies and travelers have an aversion to um, living in bricks and mortar accommodation and it's a cultural aversion and it's based on um, traditional rules of cleanliness and ways of living um, that housing doesn't provide um, appropriate appropriately for those communities many gypsies and travelers are happy living in housing but many aren't and they have a right to live in a way that is deemed culturally appropriate to them so we have this, this situation where local authorities haven't provided for gypsies and travellers. And um, in legislation, all the gypsies and travellers that I'm talking about here are acknowledged in terms of planning terms. So Romany gypsies, Irish travellers, new travellers, show people all have rights to um, accessing accommodation, even if local authorities don't provide it. However, in uh, equalities legislation, so legislation protecting people against racism and racist action, against hate crime, etc., only Romani gypsies and Irish travellers are protected because they're recognised racial groups. So you have a paradox in law. You have two different systems and a paradox in delivery via policy as well. So there's a really complex situation here occurring where gypsies and travellers are insufficiently provided for. They're treated in one way according to planning law and another way in relation to equalities law. And there's a, just a general misunderstanding of the variability of cultures and peoples that are represented under the moniker of gypsies and travellers and an essentially discriminatory environment um, for gypsies and travellers. Some research by the Traveller Movement found that 98% of people, so basically everyone, pretty much, that they um, communicated within a piece of research had experienced discrimination on the basis of their identity. They're being treated differently, being treated negatively, being excluded in some way on the basis of their identity. And at over half of those people, 55% of them, had been refused services on the basis of their identity. Now we think that we're past that. We think we live in a society that is engaging with issues such as Black Lives Matter, that's engaging in equalities issues, that is progressive. But there, you can still find many places where there are signs in the window of a pub or a shop that say, no travellers. It's shocking. In my research, the, some of the quotes, I, I wish I had time. I mean, I was worried about doing enough, having enough time today, but I can feel myself, I can talk about this forever. And I could have put up loads of quotes here. But for gypsies and travellers, you know, it, it, it's so heart-wrenching. You know, one person said, to me, I am not allowed to live anywhere. I look, feel looked down on by everyone. And another person said, I was told by a policeman that people like us should be put up against a wall and shot as there's no place for people like us in society. You know, what can I say? As part of the closure of the common land and the lack of provision of appropriate sites for gypsies and travellers. Gypsies and travellers end up, those that are mobile, those that still continue to travel for work or haven't been provided any space to stop and stay, or are travelling to see family, travelling to their weddings, funerals, etc, are placed in a situation where um, 
their stopping on any land has become illegal. The Criminal Justice and Public Order Act in 1994 made um, specific uh, recommendation or specific legislation around gypsies and travellers stopping in places so that the police and local authorities can evict them and can actually take their homes if they need if they if gypsies and travellers don't move on and as i said this is because there is this lack of understanding of what nomadism means what uh how gypsy and traveller culture is nomadic and there's what I've referred to as a sedentarist binary approach to nomadism in this country where we expect gypsies and travellers to be constantly on the move, move and never stopping and when they do stop they are criminalised, they are in breach of the law for playing out their culture, for existing and that's uh, you know that's massively um, problematic and we also found in research that gypsies and travellers are over policed in terms of offending as well now we don't know very much about gypsy and traveller um, uh, offending um, and offending behaviours there's a real lack of information on that like any community and particularly like any marginalised community there will be elements of crime amongst gypsies and traveller communities, um, you know, similar to the fact that um, white collar criminals tend to be um, white men. However, we don't know how much crime occurs in gypsies and traveller communities. What we do know is that they are disproportionately presented in prison. So the Lamy review, which was a really important big review of um, black and minority ethnic. Um, uh, inclusion in the criminal justice process um, showed that there were high numbers of gypsy and traveller prisoners. I'm actually doing a piece of research with my colleagues Coretta Phillips at the LSE and um, Becky Taylor at the um, University of East Anglia. We're doing a piece of research which is specifically looking at um, the crime and justice experiences of um, gypsies and travellers and uh, that's you the website for that I've put on the slide there, which is Realities Checked. So, as I've said, gypsies and travellers experience discrimination, they're criminalised, and as a consequence of these circumstances, they often live in hidden spaces and they lack access to good services, and they have very poor outcomes in terms of health, education and welfare. Gypsies and travellers die younger than other people, they have higher rates of perinatal mortality, they have lower rates of education, etc. And these are all things associated with social exclusion. And uh, the, the notion of all gypsies and travellers being problematic, because none of them can possibly conform to this myth of the Romany gypsy that we have. And, you know, tragically, this means that Gypsies and travellers' failure to be able to access external services means that and, and external services not appropriately engaging with gypsies and travellers means that there's a failure to address some of the internal issues within communities. So, for example, um, there's a, an excellent um, piece in uh, Travellers' Times uh, by a young woman talking about experiences of domestic violence and how um, people gain uh, help and services within such an excluded community. So you can see when we look at uh, gypsies and travellers experiences so far, we've been talking about their subjective um, experiences of violence, the hate harms they experience as hate crimes, incidents and speech. But it's evident that gypsies and travellers are socially excluded, they're criminalised and they experience discrimination which is evidence of their systemic, um, systemic experience and systemic hate arms. So what I want to move on to now, um, and I appreciate you've been listening to me for ages if you haven't paused me or put me on silent. Um, so what I want to talk to you about now is um, symbolic hate arms. Now, this is an aspect of, of my research that, as I said at the beginning, has really kind of stretched me and made me think about things. And what I've noticed is that within neoliberal capitalism, 
where we have um, everything, and this is a big study in, in criminology, we're very much aware of how um, everything in our um, public life has been reduced to a sort of managerialist approach where we need to account for costs in everything we do. It doesn't matter what we're doing, we need to um, cost benefit analysis all the time. And that has meant that we have reformed welfare, we've cut back on welfare, we're trying, we're responsibilizing people to take, um, to take responsibility for their own lives. And we are, um, we've hollowed out the state essentially. And within neoliberal capitalism, we expect people to be very flexible, to adapt. Um, we expect people to um, be prepared to change their careers, change their jobs, change their ways of thinking. Um, and, and we really require them to be flexible and adaptable around what they use and what they purchase. We live in a consumer society where we embrace um, the individualism and competitiveness of neoliberalism. So we see um, the self gaining real primacy in the modern world. So it's all about what do I look like? How do I fit in? How do I um, look better than the person next to me? Uh, I've got the latest phone or I'm the best recycler. You know, even when we engage with kind of, you know, progressive thinking around environment, for example, or inclusion, we do so in a very competitive manner. And that really augments those hierarchies of authenticity. Who's the most authentic? Who's the, you know, who's the best feminist? Who's the best, uh, you know, libertarian? Who's the best? And, and who can we put down and say they're not doing as well as us? We're constantly competing and battling with each other. And we're always having to think about the principle of the market. The market is determining what goes on and, and happens within service provision for in terms of inclusion, in terms of um, what we're talking about here. There are very scarce resources. The, the welfare reform that's occurred across um, the period of the um, post-war era, despite the the welfare developments in the initial time when we had consensus politics, um, the neoliberal capitalist project, which really occurred in the 1980s onwards with the advent of Thatcher and Reagan, etc. You've really seen this um, shift in thinking and this shift to individualist, competitive, market oriented consumerism. So this has a real, uh, research is starting to show that this is having a significant impact on our personal and social identities. So we are constantly trying to manage how others perceive us. We're also trying to manage how we are perceived by other people. Um, that's, no, that said the same thing. What I mean is we're, we're constantly being put in boxes, you know, who we are, how we react. And, and, Social science has, has identified the fact that we need to think about intersectionality. We need to think about the fact that we're lots of different things. I'm an academic. I'm also a mum of a grown up child. I'm also a girlfriend. I'm also a chocolate eater. I don't know. I've got multiple aspects to my identity, but mostly I'm probably a white middle class woman. And all of those three things impact who I am and how I relate to the world. But we're finding that increasingly that these norms of neoliberal capitalism are impacting our psychology, our way of thinking and our, our expectations. And the hierarchical nature of contemporary consumer society means that we're always kind of trying to push ourselves forward. And there is, I mean, I've put here, it doesn't matter who you hire, so long as you meet the needs of the profit motive. We don't even necessarily do that knowingly. It's incredibly difficult to live an ethical life. If we lived in eth if we concentrated on living an ethical life, it, we, I wouldn't be able to sit here now. I couldn't use Zoom. I couldn't use this computer. I couldn't use my phone. I couldn't use the pen that I'm writing with. 
I would need to think about the components of every aspect of what I'm doing and how I'm doing it. And we need to, you know, challenge that. This is problematic. And we don't, we, we, when no one talks about, people don't talk about neoliberal capitalism and the problems it, it brings. It's just assumed as that's, that's what we have. So we just accept it and we have to work within it. We assume that, um, that it's the right way to work. And we have a human rights agenda that is very much wrapped up in the norms of neoliberal capitalism. It's very neutral, but that neutrality is embedded in a white middle class principles. So I think we should talk about it and we should think about it. And we should think about it in terms of the realities of life for people who are marginalized, who are experiencing discrimination and harm. So for me, that means talking about gypsies and travellers' experiences of hate. What we've seen increasingly, especially over recent time, is that gypsies and travellers have um, been placed in such a difficult position that they have had to grasp aspects of their identity that will attain some sort of um, uh, some sort of uh, um, recognition within day-to-day -day society. Now, some gypsies and travelers have experienced racial discrimination over centuries and Romani gypsies and Irish travelers and show people to some degree have experienced that. And I am a member of the Race Matters um, Network for the British Society of Criminology and I am a passionate um, defender of um, the need to discuss race and racism but sometimes race and racism is used in a way that um, isn't beneficial for all so in this case what we have is that we have agencies and services latching on to the racism agenda rather than acknowledging who gypsies and travellers are and the breadth of their communities and that some people are missed out if they only focus on racism. That doesn't mean we shouldn't focus on the racism that gypsies and travellers are experiencing, that's hugely important. But we also need to, we need to talk about the discrimination that some gypsies and travellers experience who are not protected by um, ethnicity um, legislation. So show people are not protected um, under uh, anti-racism legislation and neither are new travellers. But they both are part of the group defined as gypsies and travellers, excuse me, particularly within planning law. And therefore they are both groups alongside Romani gypsies and Irish travellers who have rights to accommodation and to live according to their cultural norms. So you have this disjuncture coming and you also have people then pitching against each other and this again this hierarchy coming into play. Within neoliberalism this fight for resources, the minimal number of resources available to people, uh, means that people have to sort of evidence their vulnerability in order to gain the support that they need. Now, gypsies and travellers, I would not describe as vulnerable. I would describe them as resilient. They're incredible what they go through, and yet they stand up and they stand up for their rights and stand up for them, their communities. But this framing of, of people as vulnerable and as excluded and socially excluded, they are socially excluded, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're vulnerable doesn't mean that they need pity or approbation. It means that they need support and that their resilience needs to be acknowledged. I think we have a, a real problem around that, about the framing of people as needy. And it's very much coming from this white middle-class perspective of, oh, can I help you? No, we don't need to be doing that. We need to be asking communities what they need and facilitating that, not in competition with each other, but in light of their genuine and real need. And we need to stop scapegoating gypsies and travellers as some sort of pariah in our society committing crime. And, you know, it, it, the association of gypsies and travellers with dirt is very, very similar to the association of 
black and other minority ethnic communities with dirt in in past times it's a, it's a it's classic scapegoating mechanism used to um, push people out of our society to apply stigma to them as I say, gypsies and travellers have been placed in competition with each other. They're having to fight over these resources. They're trying to find their way, find their voice, be heard. And when you're trying to be heard, it's really difficult if you're trying to be heard through a really small mechanism. And services need to open up and try and start to talk about and appreciate who they're talking to and why they're talking to them. So I would argue that gypsies and travellers are experiencing hate in society in multiple ways. They're experiencing the hatefulness of crimes, incidents um, and speech, which we can really visibly see and challenge. But they're also experiencing hate through discrimination. They're experiencing hate through um, criminalization and through their social exclusion. And that hatred is imbued within the norms, language and forms of neoliberal capitalism. It is augmented and exacerbated within that setting. And we need to look at that. We need to think about how we are um, exacerbating hate through the processes within which we um, work and live and how we challenge that think about it and, and why have we got a problem why have we got such a problem with gypsies and travelers what is it what's our what's the big deal yes there's racism there's plain and simple racism there is a biological determinism that people say those people are culturally or biologically different from me and therefore I don't like them and there's you know wealth of literature around that and problematizing around that but I would suggest that it's uh, also we're we're jealous that we are we feel like we're told in neoliberal capitalism that we're free to do whatever we like but we're not we're tied to the profit motive the liberalism gives us the freedom, but the capitalism contains it. We're tied to the profit motive. So that freedom is, is not there for us. And we feel when we look at gypsies and travellers, we almost feel like they are stealing our joy, our freedom from us. And Zizek refers to this as the theft of jouissance. You know, I've put two pictures on this slide to try and sort of explain this. I've got a picture of uh, an area near where I live of a campsite. We all rush to our campsites. This whole area of the southwest is littered with caravan sites. And yet apparently we've got a massive problem with having a gypsy or traveller caravan site near us, which looks like the picture to the right. What's that all about? Why, why are we rushing off to have that freedom of the campsite, but we won't let gypsies and travellers have a campsite? I'm writing a paper about that with a colleague and about the history of, of camping and, and, uh, and how that relates to gypsy and traveller experience. We need to think about why we're so bothered and, and we need to think about that in a really careful and considered way. So I've talked at you for ages and I have no doubt that you've paused and gone and got a cup of coffee. I hope you've enjoyed um, listening to me, even though I'm talking about things that are tragic and sad in some ways. But I hope that through this talk that you have heard the, the important message, which is that gypsies and travellers are a heterogeneous communities. They are lots of different people who live in lots of different circumstances who have lots to share and are an important part of our communities and that we just need to think about how and why we stereotype and how we do that within the confines of neoliberal norms 
and we need to think about our own ethical practice and like I say I don't think any of us are capable or able to live ethically in a contemporary society we can try and we can lobby for change and doing this presentation and writing my book has been part of that process for me has been my way of saying come on people let's have these conversations I really welcome questions um my book will be out later in the year i've got the cover already so i've put a picture up there for you please do send me an email if you would like to follow up on this talk and i hope um that it's been useful to you and it's nice virtually meeting you all um okay thank you